I think I mentioned to you last week, I've studied the doctrines of grace for almost my whole Christian life, 50 years. And in studying for this message, I learned more. And I think you can always learn more of God's grace. Now, when we learn and study the doctrines of grace, they're not easy. They don't come naturally. And so I want us to know that, that if there is uh, something that's hard to swallow and it's hard to get your brain around, then it's normal and it's natural because this stretches us. But this is God's truth, and we really, really need to know this. This is, uh, we named our study, The Doctrines of Grace, The Heart of the Gospel. This is truly the heart of the gospel. I mean, this is blocking and tackling. This is fundamental to the Christian life. And, and you need this and I need this because it builds the base of why God saved us. It tells us why we need the Lord desperately. It helps us in our own Christian life. It helps us when we witness. It is just critical um, for us to understand that. So I hope that God in his mercy and grace will, will teach you tonight that I'll get out of the way and the Holy Spirit will bring thoughts to your mind and understanding that will help you grow in your Christian life. I know that this study tonight has really helped me. So we're going to jump in. And as you already know, the title of our message tonight is Total Depravity. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn to a very familiar passage in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 10 and 12, and I'm going to read those verses. Now, in these verses, the Apostle Paul was quoting Psalm 14, 1 and 3, and Psalms 53, verses 1 and 3. And here's what he writes. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Wow. Now, if you've heard me teach, you've suffered through my teaching very much. You know that I talk, uh, mention my father quite often. He had a great impact on me. He's been in heaven 22 years. He was an elder in the Presbyterian church that I grew up in and that he started. He was a successful businessman. He had a great platform in his business for witnessing for the Lord. He would always share the gospel and give men Bibles. Um, he had an infectious smile, an engaging presence, and he had a tremendous sense of humor. I, I loved him, obviously, like most, most uh, guys do, their fathers. But overall, his greatest quality was he was really a man of wisdom. And wisdom, as you know, is taking God's Word, not just in your head, but being able to apply it, right, in your everyday life. And so he was constantly giving me wisdom all the time. I would share with him, especially in my business, the problems. I'd just call him up. We talked almost every day. And I would say stuff like, Dad, what do I do when this guy doesn't pay me? He stiffed me. He's, he's left me out to dry. Or I can remember saying, how, how do I respond to this guy when he just lied to me, just completely lied to me? And I would say, what do I do when uh, people don't show up? It's critical that this person shows up today, and he ghosts me and doesn't even call me. And invariably, Every single time, he would quote this verse, Jeremiah 17, 9. Now, I want you to turn to that, and here's what he would say. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
And he said that verse to me more than any other verse. And finally, he didn't even quote it. He just said, Jeremiah 17, 9. Now, what made me kind of mad about it is he just poured cold water on my situation because there was nothing else to talk about. He just summed up my problem. And that is our problem. We all have wicked, depraved sinful hearts. That's the ultimate answer to the problems that we have. And, and this, this, this one verse really cuts to the bottom line of the bottom line of human nature. And why is that? I hope you've got this verse in front of you. Why is that? It's because it speaks to the condition of all humanity of every single human being, of our hearts, and it reflects what happened when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and what it caused. Look what he says. The heart, Jeremiah writes, is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, again, I said, I warned you, this is not easy, but it's critical that we, we understand this. Now, this simply means the very center of man's nature, the heart, is one that lies, it cheats, it's deceitful, and it's polluted at the core of my heart and your heart is deceitfulness. It's deceitfulness. Every one of us, listen, every one of us have a heart that not only deceives others, but your heart will deceive you. I know I'll forget one of my, my oldest daughter had a roommate at, at Baylor, and she decided to move and go to some college. I think it was a and I don't know. And, and her dad said, I told her to follow her heart. You never want to follow your heart, ladies. Not if you know the Bible. And so the heart is more, look, deceitful than all else. And notice, there is nothing that can be more deceitful or more misleading than someone with a human heart. Nothing has a greater capacity to be more crooked, more deceiving, more dishonest than your human nature. And, and if that isn't enough, <laughs> Jeremiah just, he just piles on. He says, and... It is desperately sick. That's what my version says, which also is translated maybe in your Bible, desperately wicked. It, it, it has with the, the meaning, it's incurable. Now, so what, what does that mean? What, what, what are you saying? Well, what's the Bible? What, what does this wickedness mean? Well, turn over to Mark chapter 7. We're going to look at uh, 21, verses 21 through 23. And I'm, I'm just going to read. I'm going to read for you what, wicked, what a wicked definition is. This is what he says, our heart's wicked. Well, what, is, what does Mark say here? He says, starting in verse 21, from within, out of the hearts of people, come the evil thoughts acts of sexual immorality, thefts, murders, acts of adultery, deeds of greed, wickedness, deceit, indecent behavior, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And all these evil things come where? From within and defile the person. Okay, buckle your seatbelt because it just gets even more graphic. And Jeremiah adds, who can understand it? 
The answer is no one. No one. Uh, You and I cannot comprehend how bad and wicked our hearts can be. We, We can't put our arms around it. We don't have the capacity, Jeremiah is saying, to measure, think about this, how wicked and evil your heart is. It is beyond you. So, so that's a lot. <laughs> now, I was thinking about this terrorist group, the Hamas. They make Adolf Hitler look like kindergarten. And I, I looked up the atrocities that they committed, and I can't even speak to you about it. I have never in my life ever heard of how evil and wicked these men treated hundreds of Jewish men, women, and children. You can't even comprehend it. The evil is unimaginable. It is unimaginable because the wickedness in the human heart, Jeremiah is telling us, listen, ladies, it is unimaginable. That's what we're seeing. And so you say, when does this start? When when did this start? Did it start when I was in first grade? (laughs) Did it start when I was in kindergarten? Did it start when I was in the crib? Well, David, David, in his confession of sin in Psalm 51, he writes it right here. And let me read it to you in verse 5. He says, speaking about himself, he's confessing his sin, he's acknowledging it, and he says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, I was brought forth in sin, And in sin, my mother conceived me. Started at conception. Started at conception. Okay. So now let's just see what does God think of it. We heard what Jeremiah said from the words of of the Lord, obviously. but, But what is God's view of your human heart and my human heart very early on in the Bible, God gives us an assessment. Now, I want you to take your Bibles, go back to Genesis chapter 1. And it talks about God seeing. Now, we know God, God sees. He doesn't have to announce he sees. He sees all the time. But usually God makes an announcement on seeing after he's done something great or he's getting ready to do something big. Okay? So here's what, here's what he writes. Genesis 1, verse 31, just after he created all of creation and mankind, he made this assessment. God saw that all he made, and behold, it was very good. That's no bad news. I mean, that that doesn't seem bad to me. but, But less than five chapters later, 174 verses. That's not much in the Bible. I want you to see his assessment. Turn to Genesis 6, verse 5. Here's what he said. Very short time period. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth. And that every, listen, every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually, all the time. So that's God's assessment. And obviously, he didn't like it. He sees something that has gone horribly wrong. What has happened from Genesis 1 to the beginning of Genesis 6? Something has happened that's devastated and ruined what he saw that he loved. What was it? He saw man's wickedness 
had become great. He observed the wicked deeds of mankind. He witnessed this evil behavior of human beings. He started witnessing all the consequences of their sin and, and all their sinful activity. And, and look again, he says, and every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. So I want, to, I want you to notice that, that our Lord not only sees the sinful behavior, but he looks past the sinful behavior, and he sees the cause, and he looks into the thoughts. Do you see that? The minds and the emotions. And he found that the source of all human evil, you guessed it, in their hearts. It's in their hearts. And, and, and the wickedness and the evil was so great that every inclination of the thoughts of human hearts was only evil all the time, continually. In short, he saw that mankind, all humans, were fundamentally and comprehensively evil. They didn't just behave immorally. They were inherently immoral. Their inner beings were rotten to the core. Their nature was not just tainted by evil. It was consumed by evil. Now, I, if you're like me, you're like, well, you got to be talking about somebody else. Not me. Because this is as bad as it gets, I think. It can't get any worse. Because God decides to pull the trigger and take action. And he announces severe consequences. Two verses later, he blots out mankind. The great flood. And you might think that afterwards got rid of all those people, only a few left, mankind was okay. I mean, they were better. I mean, after all the flood and they saw what happened? Well, I want you to look at Genesis 8, 21, and I want you to notice God's opinion of what man was like after the flood. Noah gets off the boat. Thankful to be on dry ground, the first thing he does is offer um, a sacrifice, a burnt offering. And here's what we read in verse 21. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. All right, now look what he says. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his childhood. It's still there. It's still there. M man's heart had not changed. God did a reassessment. And one commentator, he said it. This is what he said. This is God's permanent verdict on all of humanity. Every last one of us are seen in God's eyes, apart from Christ, as having every intent of the thoughts of our hearts being evil continually. And that is the doctrine of total depravity. Now, now, I think that if you're thinking, are you saying, is this right? Surely there's not some um, verses taken out of context. I mean, wh what about the people who serve and help each other so marvelous, marvelously? I, I mean, they, they, my mother, she, she was in the hospital after a car wreck, and these Muslim nurses just took fantastic care of her. Um, what about them? I had a dermatologist who, 
I had to pay him for it, but he took a skin cancer off of him. He did a great job. What about him? I'm thankful for his talents. What, what about, ladies, when you take your child to the pediatrician and they're sick and the pediatrician diagnoses something you hadn't thought of, gives them some medicine, and the next day they feel great? You know, people that help us with our health. What about them? I mean, people everywhere are doing good things all over the world, right? I mean, one Scottish minister summed it up this way, is God really saying that all the inclinations of everyone's heart is only evil and never good? I mean, every day of every month of every year is is the Bible saying that there's never a moment of good? I mean, never a good thought, never a good desire, ne- never a good wish, never a good action, only evil all the time? Those people that give their lives helping What about them? Well, that's what we're going to discuss. We're going to talk about this. And I've got four points we're going to go over. First is the confusion. We're going to talk about the confusion. Then we're going to talk about the description of total depravity. Then we're going to look at the questions many people have. And lastly, the ramification. So we're going to look at the confusion the description, the questions, and the ramification. So here's one of the confusions. A lot of people misunderstand this doctrine to mean that people everywhere are as bad as they can be. Is this what the Bible teaches? Is everyone because of sin, as bad as they can be. I I mean, we just read, every inclination of man is evil all the time. Now, let let me just say this. If you truly understand the doctrine of total depravity, you would never say that people are as bad as they can possibly be. That's not what it teaches. As evil as the Hamas terrorists are, they're not as bad as they could possibly be. They could still do more evil. Now, now let's talk about this. Number one, I want you to understand, back up how God made us. And we all know this, but number one, I want you to talk about, I want you to, to, I want us to talk about a conscience that God placed in each one of us. Now, now what is that? This conscience is in every believer and unbeliever, in every human being. And, And it's really, I like to say it's a governor. And it gives all of us some sense of God's moral law. In other words, it regulates right and wrong in our lives. There's just this sense that God placed in each one of us. Now, now Paul writes about it in, in Romans 2, verse 15. He says, "...in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience testifying, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So, so what he's saying is, even in totally depraved people, which we all are, God has placed a sense of right and wrong. You know what I'm talking about. He, put, he puts these stop signs in our lives. But the more we run them, the more insensitive we get to it, right? But this is one way I think God keeps the whole world from just killing each other. 
just mass killings, that there is a sense of right and wrong and God's moral law in all of our lives, even, even if we're bad. For the most part, people know that murder is wrong. I mean, people know that cheating is wrong. They, they try to cover it up. They know that lying is wrong. Uh, I mean, you've seen uh, people commit a horrible crime, not always, but they, they put them up and, and they have tears and they confess. So, so even though our conscience conscience is marred by sin it still works it still works to one degree or another and so I want us to understand that the doctrine of total depravity doesn't teach that people don't perform many good things and many good deeds it doesn't imply that human beings all over the world don't don't perform these selfless acts, denying themselves, risking their lives to, to help other people. Matter of fact, Jesus made note of it in Matthew 7, 11. You've heard this. He says, those who are evil know how to give good gifts to their children. There, there's still this sense of consciousness that God puts in our lives. Now, that has nothing to do with the doctrine of total depravity. So let's be clear on this. Human beings can do nice things for each other and still be totally depraved. And we're going to get into this. So we've looked at the confusion. Now I want to look at the description. I, I, want, to, I want to take one of the oldest illustrations, and I'm going to show you and give you an, an illustration. So here we go. I'm going to walk over here, and this is obviously a jug of water. And this is, I went on one of our job sites today, and I got some, what is this? <laughs> I got some stain and some uh, lacquer and some dirt. And, and if you drank this, it'd be 911. So this is bad stuff. And anyway, Amy, I, I hid this from Amy when I brought it inside. So uh, I, I want you to see that I'm going to take this here, and I am going to take this big, clear bottle of water, and I'm going to pour some of this poison in the water, okay? All right, so here we go. So I just poured a little bit in there. Can you see that? Now, now we'd all agree, wouldn't we, that <laughs> this water, whew, smell that right there. Hey, why? <laughs> That's brutal. None of us would drink it. None of us would. But it could get a lot dirtier. See, I could pour more of that toxin in that water. The water isn't as dirty as it could be. Listen, but all the water's contaminated. There's no clean water in this bottle. None of us would ever think of drinking a drop of it because it is totally, it's totally unclean. Now, this is a picture of total depravity. It's not saying that we are as bad as we can be. It's not saying that I put as much toxin in there as I can. But every part of the water is affected and every part of our human nature is affected by sin. It's contaminated by sin. Our minds, our wills, our emotions, our whole nature. We find ourselves uh, being jealous at a drop of a hat. I, I mean, we, 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 
We find ourselves being self-absorbed and getting angry just like that. Uh, our pride and our self-centeredness, centeredness, I mean, it just raises its ugly head at, a, again, a moment's notice. I mean, even maybe right after we've prayed or witnessed to someone. Sin, the Bible teaches, has affected every single square inch, every molecule in your body and my body. We can't trust our emotions because they're affected by sin. We can't always reason properly because our minds have been contaminated by sin. In fact, we go evangelize. I talked to Luke about it last night. And I mean, they lay it out, the evangelists, they lay it out super clear. And it couldn't be any more clear. And they don't get it because they can't reason because their reason is affected by sin. How do the most brilliant people we know, brilliant, highest IQ people we know, look at Christianity and scoff at it? Back to our verse. Every intent of the thoughts of their hearts is only evil continually. So, as I mentioned, we have this built-in conscience but it too is damaged by sin and it continues to be damaged over time and it can lose its effectiveness. And so, it begins to damage our understanding of the truth because every single molecule in our body, every part of our humanness is contaminated. So how do you please God? Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. He talks about the Gentiles walking in the futility of their minds. And here's what he says, being darkened in their understanding. We just said, why? Excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Here it is. Because of the hardness of their hearts. So we looked at this, this reason. Our reasoning is affected. Our conscious is affected. Our minds are affected. Our emotions are impacted. Our wills are impacted. The entirety of us has been completely ruined and damaged beyond our repair because of what Adam and Eve did in the garden. That's what sin did. That's the devastation and the evil of sin. It's so devastating and deceptive, we don't even know how devastating and deceptive and evil it is. If sin was blue, we'd all be blue. We're all toxic. We cannot please God in any way because sin is separated from us. Listen, in God's eyes, we are all polluted, and every single thing we touch is polluted. I, Steve said this the other day. I mean, if I touch this podium, I'm polluting it. That's what the doctrine of total depravity is. And so, Paul naturally wrote in Romans 8.8, it's a very familiar verse, I'll read it to you, that those who are in the flesh cannot, cannot please God. We can't do it. That, that's, that's, that is harsh, and it's unpleasant. But it is a reality that we have no way in our human condition, in our fallen condition, nothing we can do to please God. Matter of fact, we're totally displeasing to God. That, that's the horrific damage. I mean, sin, sin has rendered us powerless. I mean, completely. And every intent 
of the thoughts of their hearts was evil continually. Now, what about, what about let's talk about, um, again, let's get into more specifics about these people, the questions about total depravity that do good things. Um, these good works that people perform everywhere, we see humanitarians that just race to help those who are suffering and, and people delivering food to starving children in Africa. I saw on the news the other day where a policeman rescues a child in, in, in a car wreck, saves the child. I, I mean, surely this is pleasing to God, isn't it? Isn't it? Remember what we read earlier? There is none who does good, not even one. Now, let me say this. I'll say it again. These good things are good in and of themselves. They, they help this world tremendously, and they need to continue. But none of these incredible, loving, selfless works without Christ can please God unless you're born again, unless you've been saved from your sins, unless Christ is your Lord and Savior and the sins that are on you have been placed on Him. And when He looks at you, He looks at you as if you never sinned. Isaiah 64, 6 says this very familiar verse. All our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. You've heard this. That means minstrel rags. So our very best that we can muster up, that can put us on national news, if we're not born again, and believers in Christ, those good works are minstrel rags in God's eyes. Now, let me give you another common illustration that is not mine. I'm not taking credit for it. I modified it a little bit. Let's pretend it's Amy's birthday. And I go to my favorite florist, Mockingbird Florist, right over here. And I buy a special arrangement of gorgeous flowers and I spend too much money because I got these rare flowers and I added some decorative ornaments and personalized ribbon and, and special wrapping. And I, and I put them on the floorboard of my truck and hold them so they don't turn over. When I get home, she unwraps them. She puts them in water, sets them right there in the most prominent place, brightens her day. Every time she walks by, she thinks, what a great guy I am. <laughs> Puts a smile on her face. But what happens if there's another guy standing there in Mockingbird Floors right behind me, and it is his wife's birthday as well. And right after I finish, he's watching everything I'm doing, and he goes, you know what? I want exactly what he got. I, I want to do the same thing, just Take my order and double it. I, I want, take his order and double it. I, I want that. So he brings the flowers home, just like I did. He walks in. His wife doesn't look up. He sets the flowers down, and she starts crying. She's full of sadness. All of a sudden, she starts crying alligator tears, and she runs into the bedroom and slams the door. Well, just recently he admitted he's been having an affair. And he doesn't want to give it up. And so he's just trying to buy her approval. Uh, he, he doesn't want to change. He just wants her to let him continue what he's doing 
and living in sin and still accepting. So he's just trying to buy her approval by his good works with the deception of these beautiful flowers. And so he and I both had the same romantic gesture. It's the same florist, the same arrangement. But one was motivated by true love, and one act was motivated by selfish deception. Well, both men could be complimented, I mean, complimented by, by saying, hey, great job, good act, good, good work, that looked good. One's selfish, however, selfless, and one is selfish. One is because the husband loves his wife, and the other is because the husband is in lust with another woman and just wants his wife to go along. Is buying your wife an arrangement of flowers a good thing? Is it a good work? Sure it is, but it depends on your heart. It depends on your motive. One is motivated by love and appreciation, and one is motivated by falsehood, lying, and deceit. And here's the point. You can't just look at someone's actions to determine if they're good or bad. You have to know what motivates them deep inside their heart because that's what God looks at. Listen, ladies, we cannot play spiritual adultery with God and expect Him to be pleased with us. That, that's, that's the point. The children of Israel, they wanted everything that God would give them, but they didn't want Him. See, the point is, is that any, quote, good work, good thing we do in and of ourselves without faith in Christ will never secure his acceptance of us. There is no way that second husband will ever secure a relationship with his wife while he's loving something or someone else. And that's what the Bible's teaching about all of our good works. We love ourselves. We're satisfying ourselves. We're trying to work our way. We're loving the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, and that's what we're living for. We don't care about Christ. We've, we've ignored him. We spit in his face. We're, 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 we're having an affair on him. And so how could we ever be accepted with anything we do in his eyes? How would he ever be pleased with it? He won't. He can't. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith... It is impossible to please God. There is no relationship apart from faith in Christ. You see, as one commentator said, as God looks down on the world, he isn't pleased with good actions because they're being done by people who are living lives in rebellion against him. They're not doing it for him. They aren't seeking to please him. They're cheating on him. They're in love with something else. And God will not be mocked. And he is a jealous God. And that is the danger of us thinking that we can work our way. You see how this just destroys any man-made religion, any good work. It's impossible. Augustine said this, the virtue of the unconverted are splendid sins. What, what does he mean by that? 
unconverted, unbelievers, their virtue are splendid sins. The sins that look good to everybody else, the good works that make everybody else say, that's a great girl or a great woman or a great man. And in God's eyes, they're sins. And Augustine says they're splendid sins in their mind, but they're still sins that cannot please God. So let's go to the last point. We'll try to end up here pretty quick. What this tells us is all of humanity is headed to total ruin. The wickedness in the human heart can't do any other. It's not going to get better. I mean, this, this explains why we need to vote, but you know what? The politicians are not going to make it better. The only thing that's going to make it better is one heart at a time that comes to Christ. Now, I'm not saying don't go vote, but I'm just saying ultimately, what changes people is they first have to be saved, converted, come to Christ and washed from their sin. I was sick, that 22-year-old beautiful nursing student in Georgia, out for a jog in the morning, in the broad daylight Thursday, murdered, brutally murdered by a 26-year-old immigrant, illegal. And I'm always amazed how people cover these tragedies, and they always want to know why. Why would somebody do this? Why would somebody shoot? Why would somebody kill? Why would somebody murder? And nobody answers. Well, everybody in here should be able to answer tonight. It's the human heart. It's the human heart. It shows us who we are. This is reality. This is why we have wars and rumors of wars, because of the human heart. But God did not leave us helpless. Praise God. And you don't, as Steve says a million times, if you don't know the bad news, you don't know the good news. Right? You've got to come to the point and understand who you are. It was Monday morning, August 17th, 2009. I'll close with this. I woke up and felt weird. I felt like I'd never felt before. I, I couldn't even describe it. I, I felt so strange. Something inside of me was wrong, <laughs> and I wanted to have it diagnosed so I could fix it. it. Even Amy said, I looked pale. I got up, I went in my office, and I said, something is not right, and I can't even explain it. So I did all I knew to do. I got in my truck, and I drove up to... At that time, I was a member of Cooper Fitness Center, and I walked in, and I said, I need to see a doctor. And thankfully, they said, well, Dr. Ken Cooper has an opening. And so I walked in there, and he ran me through a battery of tests, and he put me on a treadmill. And I remember him saying, I was on the treadmill, he said, there's nothing wrong with you. I was like, good. But I knew something was wrong. And then afterwards, at the very end, he listened to my heart, and he stopped. And he said, have you ever had a heart murmur? And I said, no. He said, well, you have a loud heart murmur. And he said, I want you to go over here to this other doctor, and we're going to do an echocardiogram. We're going to figure out what's wrong with your heart. And I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Huh. <laughs> 
And so I go into the other office, and I remember, I can remember like it was yesterday, I'm laying on this table, and, and the doctor is rubbing this thing on me, and he's looking at the screen, and I said, what is wrong? <laughs> and he said, you have a torn mitral valve. You have these fibrous cords that are attached to your mitral valve, and a lot of them have torn, and it's severe. I was like, what? Like, I didn't have it yesterday. And I said to him, well, how do you fix it? Well, that's the diagnosis. Well, what are you going to do to fix my heart? And he said, open heart surgery. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> I'm not doing that. And it was a few months later that the surgeon opened me up and he took Gore-Tex thread and he sewed up that valve. And you know what he said afterwards? He said, you never have to see me again. He fixed my heart. That's the picture. That, that's where we are spiritually. Our hearts are broken. And we have to come to a diagnosis, a proper diagnosis, that they are broken and beyond repair, and someone outside of us has to fix it because we can't fix it ourselves. The sin of Adam caused it. And every one of us have a totally depraved, wicked heart that needs help that is beyond us helping ourselves. And... That's the problem. And until, ladies, you understand that and your loved ones understand that, you will never, ever cry out for God to help you because you're always trying to do it yourself. So it's critical for us to, to come to the proper diagnosis to see it. And, and God... He's the only one that can take his skillful hands and take his threads of mercy and grace and sew our heart up and give us a heart of flesh and take away the heart of stone. That's our hope. That's where we are. Have you come to grips with your depravity? It's not easy. It's not easy. I, I hope you have. You know, in a group this size, there's, there's people that are still trying to work their way. They think somehow they can fix the problem, and you can't. You can't. If you're sitting there and you're trying to work your way, and you're trying to work a little bit harder and a little bit harder, you have got to come to the reality how dead your heart is and how you need a loving Savior to fix it. It was done at the cross. Jesus paid the price, and he cleanses our hearts from sin and death because he did it, not us. May God help us to see this truth and, and to live it. You see, what God wins us with, he keeps us with. We need to continue to realize that sin still remains. Amy can tell you. 
My sin still remains. But by God's grace, we have the answer, the glorious answer. Let's pray. Father, Father, thank you. Thank you that we have regained all we need, not because of what we did, but because of what you did for us. Father, we pray that we would never be prideful, that we would look at who we really are and how we were born and the wickedness in our heart and compare ourselves to your holiness, to your love and your mercy, and to continue to throw all of ourselves on you, to love you, to walk with you, to tell others about you, and to sing loving praises of thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.